Good evening. I'm Robert Bergino, the Chancellor of UC Berkeley. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation in this ongoing series of public events sponsored by the Chancellor's Office and the Graduate School of Journalism. The purpose of this series is to bring leading thinkers from the worlds of media, business, and government to campus to discuss and debate the most important issues of the day. These public panel discussions are consistent with our mission as a public teaching and research university to make broadly available to the people of California leading thinking on important national and global society issues. These fora, billed as conversations with Dean Orville Schell, are among the most successful public events here at Berkeley, as you can tell from tonight's sold out performance, or attendance, pardon me. I'd like to thank Orville for organizing the event series. Uh, as you may know, this uh, sadly is Orville's last year presiding as Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism after a decade. He's been a brilliant leader for the school, enhancing its national standing and drawing major world leaders and thinkers to campus for public programs on key contemporary issues such as we are doing today. A well-known and distinguished China scholar, Orwell has been named director of the Asia Society's new Center for U.S.-China Relations. You can clap. <laughs> Alice hesitated for a minute. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to thank the other sponsors of tonight's event, including The Economist, The Haas School of Business, the Institute of International Studies at UC Berkeley, and the World Affairs Council. And tonight's program will also be taped for broadcast on KQED Radio 88.5. Tonight's presentation, The View from Abroad, Is America Broken? brings us John Micklethwaite, Editor-in-Chief of The Economist, in conversation with Dean Orville Schell. This is John's first visit as Editor-in-Chief of the world's leading business and current affairs weekly to, Ber to Berkeley. Uh, introducing our panelists will be Andreas Kluth, the West Coast correspondent for The Economist and lecturer at our Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, Andreas has been a correspondent for The Economist since 1997. He covers technology and other stories from the San Francisco Bay Area, where he has been based since 2003. Before arriving in the Bay Area, Andreas was based in Hong Kong for four years, covering primarily business and finance in China and Southeast Asia. Andreas has a master's degree in international political, political economy from the London School of Economics and a Bachelor of Arts from Williams College in Massachusetts. Let me now invite Andreas Kluth to the podium to introduce our panelists. Andreas. Thank you, Chancellor Bergenau. Um, just a few minutes ago, I came under some unexpected pressure from senator forces in our marketing department that they asked me to begin by asking for a show of hands how many of you are economist readers. Justin, are you counting? <laughs> and I'd like to add, um, how many of you hate The Economist? <laughs> and how many of those who hate it have renewed their subscriptions? As Chancellor Bergenau said, my name is Andreas Klute, and I'm the, you know, I write for The Economist and I also lecture part-time at the journalism school here, and that explains why I'm here at all. Uh, it's because you're about to witness my boss being interviewed by my boss. <laughs> uh, 
My first boss is John Micklethwaite. He became editor-in-chief of The Economist uh, last April after our previous editor, Bill Emmett, stepped down after having been in that job for over a decade. And I need to tell you how I personally realized that this was an epic and historic event. It was when Gawker, which is a media blog, uh, covered this as breaking news. And just when it was confirmed, the following post hit the wires. Um, it had a picture of John and said he's now made it. And uh, John was called the dashing heartthrob of the Economist's Tower in London and an all-around good guy. <laughs> and because it's a new medium, uh, participatory medium, readers get to you know, respond in the common pain. So the first comment, I didn't read below that, not everyone will get this, I had to Google it, it was just a question. Chase Talbot III look-alike or just plain English? You decide. John went to Magdalen College in Oxford, as his predecessor did, and many people at The Economist did too, uh, for interesting reasons, uh, that not for here. Uh, uh, he started his career in the city of London in the 80s when there was something called the Big Bang. Um, it was sort of a period of cowboy capitalism and deregulation and a time of adventure when a lot of journalists were leaving and really starting in finance, and John was one of them, but then he went the other way and joined The Economist, and that was about 20 years ago. And he then, for the next 20 years, did what we do at The Economist, moved around every couple of years or so, so he's covered pretty much everything. Um, he's, uh, in particular, he started in the early 90s, he started the LA Borough, then he came back to London to be business editor, then he returned to America to be bureau chief in New York. Then he returned to London to be United States editor, and that's the job he had when he uh, became editor-in-chief editor in April. Um, one of the things I don't understand about people like John and other colleagues of mine is how they write books on the side without ever being in any hurry when you meet them in the elevator. Um, that's something maybe British, maybe they're just putting it on. <laughs> He's co-writing his books with Adrian Wooldridge, whom some of you have read, if you like our Lexington column. Um, the two of them have written four books, uh, The Witch Doctors, A Future Perfect, which was about globalization, The Company, a brief history of that strange institution, the firm, uh, and The Right Nation, a study of conservatism, conservatism in America. And they're now working on their fifth book about the rise of religion around the world. And John will be interviewed by my other boss, Orville, and I just, Chancellor Burgeon, you, you all know him. Um, I just want to briefly tell you how I first heard the words Orville and Shell. It was when I was in Asia and hanging out in China a lot, and I kept hearing that name. I first knew of him, therefore, as one of the great sinologists of this, great, of this generation. And when we moved here, um, I called him up and he took me out to lunch, which was very nice. <laughs> And then he then, for reasons I don't quite understand, asked me to come and give talks and lectures and, and, and help out at the journalism school. So of course I did. That was a great honor. Um, he has written 14 books, which is just an astonishing number. Uh, and nine of those were about China, including Virtual Tibet, Mandate of Heaven, Dis Discos and Democracy, and I'm sure many of you here have read those. And he's written for every major publication in America, so I'm not going to bother to list those. Um, from everything I gather, he's been at the, dean of the journalism school for 10 years. From everything I gather, he made the school what it is. It was an okay school, I believe. I, I wasn't here. And he's now made it into one of the top four schools in the country, if not the world. And I cannot, he's been such an inspiration to me, I cannot tell you what a huge loss his departure is for this campus. And of course, I know he has fascinating stuff lined up at the Asia Society in New York for the fall, and I wish him luck. And with that, um, I get out of the way so they can discuss uh, the demise and possibly imminent disappearance of America. Please welcome <laughs> John Micklethwaite and Orville Schell.
Well, it's great to uh, see so many of you here, and it really is a <coughs> credit to uh, John's magazine. I think that uh, there is such incredible interest, uh, in, in, still in such incredible interest in a magazine. Um, let's start out, John. Uh, how old are you? <laughs> I'm uh, 44. Now, I, 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 I've, I've heard it said that, that no incoming editor in recent times of The Economist has ever been older. Is that, can that be true? That's true. Both my um, predecessors were appointed in their 30s. And how do you analyze that fact? I think it's, it's been a tradition. We've always had this idea of having quite young editors, uh, partly because I suppose the job is reasonably grueling, but, but also because... It's just seemed to work that way. It, um, it means that um, every generation or so, there's a, there's, a, there's a slight kind of changing of the guard, which usually helps. And, and are you married? Do you have children? Do you have a life outside of The Economist to contend with? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm married with three children. And you... Uh, and a dog. And a dog. <laughs> and, and do you find that uh, uh, that keeps your plate pretty full? Yeah, I, th I think it's a... Um, it's a rather pompous thing to say, but I think when you get one of these jobs, a variety of people who hold similar ones come and give you long lectures about how your life's going to change and about how you've got to make time for things. And you imagine this is, particularly if you're a journalist and you're not used to taking instructions, you imagine that this is a, a rather strange, stupid corporate thing. But actually, I think it is, it, it's a real challenge, to be honest. No, I don't want to dwell t too much on you, but maybe uh, just as we start here, tell us, how would you describe yourself, uh, politically speaking? I think my politics are probably the same as The Economist, which is uh, to be a liberal in the, the classical sense of that word, which is difficult sometimes to explain to Americans because the word liberal here has been... I was about to use the word perverted, but that's a somewhat unfortunate <laughs> one. But it's a... It's a if you, if you look back to where The Economist came from, to where liberalism came from, it was, it was a mixture between economic liberalism, the liberalism of, of small government, of open markets, and state keeping out of the way, and also the... Uh, and we started by fighting against the corn laws, the main kind of bit of protectionism of that time. If you go back to the beginning of The Economist, you also see... We, we, right from the beginning, we had social liberalism in our blood. Um, we fought against capital punishment fought against slavery, fought for penal reform. And those two elements of liberalism, I think, in America, in some ways, have got divided. I mean, you have the Republican Party, which tends, well, at, least, at least until its recent incarnation, to favor small government. And then you have the Democrat Party, which, which tends to take the liberal side when it comes to social issues, but um, has embraced this strange and deeply oxymoronic creation of, of, uh, creation of big government liberalism when it comes to economics, and that is a, a tension, I think. And as, as you look in, uh, at least partially from the outside, although you spent many years here, how do you uh, understand the fact that liberalism has come to be such a besmirched word? I think largely, well, two reasons. One, I think there's an element, if you, if you grab hold of an ideology and then only get hold of one bit of it, then it's, it's always quite difficult sometimes to maintain it. But it's also obviously due to the fact that the Republicans seized on it and started attacking it repeatedly. It's quite interesting. If you go back to the 60s, the word liberal is used repeatedly. There's a, um, I think it's a, a nice quote by John Kenneth Galbraith, which says something like, these are the years of the liberal. Everyone is liberal at this time. And you, you read about Goldwater when he ran in the 60s. And the word conservative was utter anathema. And then you jump forward to the last election and you have John Kerry desperately almost pathetically, claiming that he's a conservative, really. He's not, you know, the word liberal should not be applied to him in any way at all. And that, that actually is a big sort of sea change. I mean, indeed, when, when Goldwater ran, uh, I think many, many Americans reacted with, with almost horror at his conservatism, and yet by the standards of today, his conservatism was rather mild. I think you could make the argument um, that Goldwater in some ways... Was a, was a liberal. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to push this too far, but because he obviously had some some very conservative traits, but he basically believed in small government. But he also believed in actually the government sticking, <clears throat> staying out of your life. So on issues like abortion, all those type of things, he 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 was, and he he kept on criticising the Republicans for that throughout his later years. 
Do you, do you feel you've written a whole book on the American right? Do you feel that the uh, sort of drift rightward for this country, I know you feel it is a kind of uh, uh, an expression of its natural tendencies, but do you think it's a healthy tendency? I think you can't. I, to go, I think some ways it's been healthy, some ways it hasn't. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of the way that countries develop. I think it does. I think there is something conservative about many parts of America, not necessarily San Francisco. Um, uh, but if you, if, you, if you go to the bits, the small area between here and New York, that you, there, there's, there is quite a, a wide berth of people there who don't... The, the, the basic psychology of America, I think, particularly if you compare it with other countries, I think you can make the argument quite strongly it is, it is, a, a, it is a conservative country to the extent that if you look at, say, the Democratic Party now and you put it alongside any of the allegedly conservative parties in Europe. If you took the British Tories, British Conservative Party, by far the most powerful kind of right-wing party in Europe, right-wing except for the sort of lunatic racist bits, but the, but the, 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 um, the racist parties, but the, 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 most standard, the most standard European right-wing party, the most successful Conservative Party pretty much in politics throughout the um, ever. If you take them and the Democrats and you put them alongside each other, I think you can make a very compelling case that actually the Democrats are way to the right of where the Tories are when it comes to many issues like the size of government. Um, the Democrats actually believe in a, the sort of government which John Kerry was running for was sizably smaller than the type of things the Tories support. You look at things like crime and punishment, the sort of um, crime and punishment that John Kerry supported and actually bragged about as a young prosecutor were far more vengeful than the, Tor than the Tories would support. I mean, a good statistic is that America sends people to prison at five times the rate that Britain does. And Britain is the toughest <coughs> imprisoner in Europe. And to what do you owe that unhappy uh, state? Uh, well, it's, I mean, it could, in some, some ways, crime here has come down a tiny bit, whilst, whilst it's, continued, it's gone up in Europe recently. I, I think there are some elements of, um, you, you, can, you can go back to some areas to do with conservatism. You can claim that America was founded by um, companies and by churches. And so in a sense it had sort of capitalism and religiosity hardwired into it. I think you can also say that the geography of America plays some role in it. If you, if you have a place where, and I, I'm going to get the statistics wrong, that basically if you, if you took all the people, if you gave each person in America a, a, a space, I think it comes out at about sort of one or two square miles or, or a, a reasonably big amount of area. You go to Europe, Europe is a much more crowded con continent. You have, in a sense, to get on more with your neighbours. You have to um, deal in a sort of more socialistic way, almost by definition. And if you look at horizontal America, if you look at the suburbs, those have tended to be conservative places. You look at vertical America, places like San Francisco and New York, those have tended to be more leftish. And so you could, yeah, you, I mean, I wouldn't take geographic determinism too far, but that isn't, that, I think that is part of it. Do you, do you think, uh, I, I should just quickly say that I uh, uh, was on the O'Reilly show once, and I had the uh, misfortune <coughs> of saying that, by and large, it seemed to me, uh, the better educated a community was, the more liberal they were. Well, I got about 500 of the most vitriolic emails from people saying, does that mean if you're conservative, you're stupid? <laughs> now, do you think education leads towards liberality, or is well, it I, I, would, <laughs> I would naturally... I'd naturally argue that um, it, it leads towards liberalism of my sort, whether it leads to liberalism of the, of the Democratic Party is more difficult. Um, the, the only, it's difficult to measure. I haven't, seen, I haven't actually seen statistics on education. What is true is if you look at the fastest growing, most vibrant bits of America, I think if you, in the last election out of the 100 fastest growing counties, 97 of them were won by Bush. So if you, if you think about that, those are the bits of America which are sprawling out fastest, which are growing quickest. And so whatever American conservatism is, it is actually a much more a kind of aggressive, forward-looking, optimistic creed than what an old version of conservatism is. And in fact, you could argue just as liberalism, um, we're getting into a lot of ism suddenly, but, but if you, if you, just as liberalism in America has gone off in a slightly strange direction, actually you can argue American conservatism in many ways is 
quite an odd descendant of its European parents because the conservatism in Europe was much more based around trying to protect the past, um, look, very worried about the future. You then look at somebody like Ronald Reagan, almost exactly the opposite, always thinking the future holds a brighter day. Um, conservatism in Europe was generally about trying to protect an old order. By contrast, on the whole, in America recently, it's been the, the conservatives in the middle who've been trying to tear down the barriers, get rid of things. And, you know, Bush ran against the establishment. That's the way the conservatives always run. And that's, I, there are various ways in which they've sort of changed um, the philosophy. They, they, you know, they hang on to things like flags, religion, patriotism, all those type of things are sort of old conservative stuff. But they, they, it, has, it has changed in America in an interesting way. Well, l l let's talk a bit about the media because uh, you, after all, are an editor and uh, I, a journalist. Um, how is it that at a time when almost every media outlet that we can think of uh, seems to be melting away before our eyes, that The Economist grows at 15% a year. I mean, what, what is it that brings these people into this room and that makes them read your publication? What's the magic that eludes Time and Newsweek and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I think the reasons why, I mean, I'm not going to go on to the, the competition, but I think the reasons why we've grown are partly to do with actually the way the world has changed. Um, I think the fact that we, we've always taken a global viewpoint to things, and I think that's, that, that actually has made a difference, is that whereas 25 years ago, it was quite a, might have been a hard sell to come to somebody in the Bay Area and say you needed to know about the rest of the world. Well, now, if you, if you work for a, um, a software company in Silicon Valley, your job could disappear to somebody in Bangalore um, if you have a manufacturing company up in Marin or something, your, 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 your company could face competition from Finland, from Russia, from places you never previously thought about. And by the same token, politically, the whole thing could be upset by a, a lunatic in a cave in Afghanistan. So that the idea that the world has got smaller has helped us. And the same token, the, the fact that people now travel much more, they, 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 people are more wired into that world, again has helped us. And you could argue that the media generally has tended to sort of bifurcate. Is that we, the, the economist strategy, which was to go and find, for lack of a better word, kind of well-educated, internationally orientated people, but to try and find them all the way across Liberals. the world. Well, yes, but we would, I, no, I, we're, we're very unchoosy about the people who write it. We, 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 we get furious letters from mm -hmm. people on all sides of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. And in fact, actually, I think that's, that's, I wouldn't ever want to get identified with a particular party, I think that's a, that's a sort of fatal element about it. Once you get seen as, I, I'd like to think in any American election or any British election, people would, would try desperately to guess which side we were likely to, to back because that, we've, never, we've never stuck with one for very long. It's sort of curious, isn't it? Because the tradition in Europe, of course, is that newspapers do have uh, party or political affiliations. That, and you uh, almost curiously have chosen the American model, the agnostic model, or at least keep your readers a little bit confused. We're, not, we, we, we're a mixture, actually. We're, we're in the middle, because on the one hand, we do make our views known. I mean, there's always a, there's every single election. I remember way back with Bush and Dukakis, which I think is the one example where we didn't endorse either side because we just thought the, the, the basic, the basic, um, the basic uh, I, I shouldn't really talk about my predecessors, but, the, but the, the basic idea was that they were both so awful that you wouldn't want to <laughs> choose between them. And actually, in fact, um, that's, it's, an, it's an easy laugh to get, but actually I think that was, uh, and I think the, my predecessor at the time would have said the same thing. In, in retrospect, that was a lazy decision, <clears throat> because in the end, you have to go out and vote, and you buy a journal of opinion. In the end, that journal should be able to say, you know, one might be only 1% better than the other, but you should go for that one. And so I think it is, I think, I've, I've always been, it's slightly strange, those things where people can write editorials about everything else, and then the one question which would probably matter most, they then say, well, actually, I can't do that because it's too difficult. Now, I know you don't particularly want to talk about your competition by name, but if you look at the American media landscape in general, what do you see? In terms of its I, I, th I think in general, the American media landscape is much healthier than, than people inside it feel. I, I don't deny for a second that the, 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 a rampage is going through. A hurricane basically has hit 
the industry. If you look at what's happened to newspapers, it's been dramatic, and you can see evidence all about it. We, somebody, we're having lunch today with somebody from the Chronicle who pointed out that down in, I think down in a, um, the, south of here somewhere, somebody just sacked all their journalists and replaced it with citizen journalists, which were people, normal people who come in and just do a little bit of time here and there. There's, there's, a, there's a huge change going on, in particular the aspect of, of classified advertising, what Rupert Murdoch called the rivers of gold of the newspaper industry. And I used to have an office years ago at the Los Angeles Times, and that, it seemed at the time that nothing could really stop it. Here was a business which could keep on going and going and going. And that undoubtedly has got much more difficult. And you can see problems in various bits of the American media. But I think overall, the actual quality, thanks to what's happening on the web, has increased. There are all sorts of problems to do with blogs. There are all sorts of problems to do with the quality of the stuff online. But I think overall, it adds to the picture. If you look at the amount of comment you can now pick up in America, it is greater than there was before. And although it's, you know, that might be comment which I'm not very happy with, maybe comment which many people here find confusing and wrong, but it's, it is, I think, better for having more choice for people. There is, there is a slight worry, I think, about people, the fact that the world has got so ta targeted, so narrow-casted, that you could, for instance, get up in the morning listen to Rush Limbaugh, turn on Fox News, read a conservative paper. You could just keep in one very small, narrow mindset. And the ability to open up, particularly if you're stuck on those sites on the internet, would be much more difficult. So there is a sort of problem there. But lots of people um, would argue previously that, the, that, the, that, the, that there was no such choice. I mean, one undeniable trend, I think, in journalism, as in the rest of life, uh, is the, the seduction towards celebrity, and yet you don't even allow your poor <laughs> scribes to have names. No pictures, no. Yeah. And no pictures. Uh, and I know there's a good bit of grousing sometimes about that because they feel they don't, they don't exist in a certain sense. Uh, that's a bit counterintuitive, isn't it, that you succeed by being anonymous? Well, I think, I think the, anon the anonymity, in a weird way, everyone always comes and asks us and say, why do you do this? And the answer is, we haven't done anything. We've kept the same and everyone else has changed. Everyone else, every newspaper used to be anonymous, basically. And they've all, they've all gone the other direction. Why do we keep it? Firstly, because it's, I suppose, a brand. It's part of what The Economist is. But it's more than just a sort of marketing gimmick. I think it goes to the way in which we work, which is somewhat collaborative. People, pe pe stories come in, and then we digest them, we go through them, and we do change them. And so if, say, Andreas would probably appear and start attacking me, if he was to write something um, in praise of the mayor of San Francisco and we were, to say, to decide that um, he wasn't quite as wonderful as he appeared to be at the moment, and, and changed it by putting the word not occasionally into sentences, <laughs> then, <laughs> then we, would, um, we would suffer. <clears throat> we, we, it would be okay to do that because it appears under the Economist brand rather than under the Andreas Kluth's name, where obviously it would be wrong for something to appear directly under his name and not be the same. So there is an element of the collaborative spirit of The Economist is actually key to the way in which we work. Um, let, let, let's turn for a minute to some of the, the big issues. After all, our larger topic is uh, America yeah. broken. Um, describe for us the uh, magazine's position on uh, the war in Iraq. War in Iraq we supported. Um, is that past tense, <coughs> present tense? Uh, we supported at the time. I mean, it, can't, it, it, it has not been a success. I think we one way of looking at it. You, your support but, well, for the we, war or the war? Well, the war, the war has not been a success. I think in terms of our support for it, I think it's another thing which, I mean, well, firstly, I should say it was a decision taken by my predecessor, and we, um, we, we, we have an honourable truce whereby he doesn't criticise me and I don't criticise him. Um, but on the question... Uh, I think the main, thing for, the main issue for Iraq, for me at the moment, is do you back the surge or don't you? And there again, to be provocative, we did, we did back the surge. Not because we think the surge is going to rescue Iraq and make it into a liberal democracy in a matter of months. Um, far from it, we think the choice in Iraq is really between total disaster and mild failure, or, or failure basically. But we do think that when people think that it can't get any worse, the answer is it can. And it's for that reason we backed it. Um, we have doubts about the number of troops. We have doubts about all types of things, not least the government of Maliki. 
But unless we think of America and Britain to withdraw now would be, um, would, 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 would be disastrous because the prospects of both Iraq descending into a, an even worse, even nastier civil war than we have at the moment and also the possibilities of regional contagion are too great. So even if the surge doesn't work, we still think it, was, it would be worth a try. If you look back at, at your uh, decision to support the war, uh, do you think it was a wise decision, uh, or do you, do you, I mean, don't criticize your previous editor, perhaps. But it's just, very difficult to do that. <laughs> or just you personally. Uh, I, I supported the war. Um, it, it's a, it's been one of the things you go back endlessly um, over it, and the, the, I suppose one obvious, and I don't put this forward as an excuse, but I think that people who did support it could at the very minimum have expected um, a degree of efficiency or indeed com competence on a, on a level way, way, way beyond um, what happened. And our, our, from an editorial point of view, um, what we did was we supported it, but we began to report very quickly all the ways in which it had gone wrong afterwards. And so you can look at issues such as whether they should have gone through debathification and all those type of things, which, which I think were hopelessly, incompetently handled, almost right from the beginning. And then there was a succession of disasters after that. So I think it's, it's, you get stuck into a relentless what-if um, policy, which, which is hard to do. But l let me just be a little bit the devil's advocate here. Uh, would it not be fair to say that when the decisions were being made about the war, there was also a, an assessment to be made about those people who were making those decisions yeah. and their ability to actually carry out effective policy. Uh, uh, I think there, was, there were a number of uh, very intelligent people who had absolutely no faith that that could happen in any way uh, other than the way it did. Uh, did you actually have confidence that uh, the American government, as it was constituted then, could pull off a thing like this? I think we had confidence. We, we certainly had confidence that there were WMD there. Um, not least, I mean, one reason why <coughs> I did was because you met a lot of people from intelligence agencies, not just American and British, but from countries that opposed the war, who relentlessly said that they thought they were there. Um, and so from that perspective, and I, I think probably on that level, I, I'd be sort of reasonably happy about letting Bush and Blair off the hook on one point, as I think they both generally thought there was WMD there. What was much less um, decent, explicable, and indeed fundamentally wrong was the way they exaggerated the case. They put across evidence which, yes, we, you know, we, we accepted things which turned out to be completely wrong. And by and large, do you, does your uh, magazine still support Blair, or are you, or how would you say the well, we balance? Called, we called for him to, to go a bit, a bit ago, mm -hmm. well, it, largely on the basis that he, um, we thought it was a mistake for him to hang around in this sort of strange halfway house where he's neither there nor going. And now, now he's, um, he, he's due to go in June. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem, I mean, he, he, when I go and see him, he seems to regard this with amusement. But anyway. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you don't uh, fault his deportment uh, as... Uh, we didn't call for him to go on the back of Iraq, um, yeah. no. And you, did you, do you think that it was wise from the perspective of Britain for him to have uh, been such an ally of our president? I think the way in which... I think the main things you can criticise Blair for in that are... And I'm, I'm looking at it from a British viewpoint, which is not... The Economist looks at it from a global viewpoint, but looking at it from a purely British viewpoint, I think it's, you could argue from Blair's point of view, he got very little back in return. I think the one thing which Blair always genuinely thought he was going to get back out of it was some degree of movement on the Israel-Palestine issue, and he got nothing, or he got very, very little. I mean, he would, he would, if you saw Blair now, Blair would argue it's just about to happen, there's going to be change in that particular arena. But the answer is no, he didn't get what he wanted. And actually, in different, I'm not here particularly to sort of, as I said, to advance any kind of British view of it. But I think you can argue at different stages of the Iraq thing, actually, some of the things the British were putting forward, they should have listened to. Debathification, the army, all those things the British argued against and were, and were ignored. So from that perspective, I think Blair didn't get, and he didn't get the kind of leverage that he'd hoped he'd get. I think the thing which is interesting is what exactly and I don't know the answer, what exactly would have happened if Blair had said no? 
I mean, what would happen at that particular time to the, to, to the, to the British-American relationship? Well, would he not have had a lot more leverage? He might have done. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's what we'll never know. At the time, mm -hmm. at the time it would have caused an um, uproar, um, mm -hmm. but he might have been right to. Well, uh, speaking of uproars of that nature, uh, help us understand a little, as not a continental, but at least a European, what is it about America's uh, sort of fixation on the French? <laughs> Which it's, the first, first thing to point out is it's mutual. Um, the, 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 the French, are, French are fixated by America. You, you, you can, if you attend an event like this in, in France, all you get asked about is repeatedly is about America and what America's going to do. And you can take this all the way back to Lafayette and Washington if you want. The, the French, uh, the, 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 there, there is an element whereby they both epitomize different views of the world. And you could argue in Chirac and Bush, you almost have a sort of caricatures of what one side imagines the other one to be. Um, and and, and that, that makes it even more difficult than it would otherwise be. And the weird thing about the French is actually if you go there and you know, the McDonald's grows by some astronomic amount every year. You look at books about America, things to do with America, Disneyland, the whole lot. They, they actually embrace great, great quantities of American things and, 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 and yet fundamentally there is a real resistance and there always has been it goes you know you, you would know this better than me but it goes right the way back to de Gaulle and it goes back beyond that this this desire that France must follow its own course um, and that there's a question mark about how useful that sometimes has been and how would you say uh, uh, the relationship between Britain and the United States will fare post Tony Blair what, what, what will we expect it's difficult because basically you have um, Gordon Brown, uh, who it's, what's basically happening in Europe at the moment is the end of two rather strange um, psychodramas. And in, in France, you have the rather weird Oedipal struggle between Sarkozy and Chirac, which is now entering some final terminal bloody phase with the introduction of Ségolène Royal, who I, I, I'm not good on Greek myths, so I can't exactly, Clytemnestra or something, anyway. She, she, she's appeared, and so that's all very complicated. But Chirac will eventually go this summer. But in, in, in Britain, you have this sort of Cain and Abel struggle between Brown and Blair, where finally, after quite a lot of time of trying and missing, in, in June this year, Blair will, you know, Brown will manage to plunge the knife into, in, into, into Blair, and, and Blair will go. But the problem is, Behind that is that Gordon Brown, we know some things about him. He, he, he likes America to the extent that he comes here often on holiday. He, he's always had strong links to the area around Harvard. He does show um, some elements of being kind of you know, fascinated by bits of America and working with bits of America. But, but against that, he's very much used... Um, you have to look at him very much from the perspective of somebody desperately trying to get hold of a job. And from that perspective, it has suited him or suited people around him to imply to the Labour Party, which has never historically been that friendly towards America, particularly towards Republican presidents, um, it has suited him to imply that he would actually be much tougher with Bush than Blair was. And my guess is actually, if he got in, there wouldn't be a dramatic change for two reasons. One, because Brown would have to deal with the realities. You know, he has got, he, he would suddenly wake up with troops in Iraq what do you do with them, troops in Afghanistan? And sort of responsibilities would suddenly land on him. But the second thing is also because, to some extent, America has changed. You know, you, you're now dealing with a, um, a slightly more modest operation in terms of America actually trying to push Britain into things. So it would, it, it, there may not be a big change, but we don't know. I mean, do you think America has overreached and has, has gotten to some kind of a tipping point in terms of its ability to lead globally and to be actually the number one superpower? I think, I think America still, I mean, goes slightly to the title you've got up behind us, is that the America, the neoconservatives basically got it wrong to the extent that they thought America had this enormous positive power. America could decide what would happen in different areas. And it, it, basically, in retrospect, America did not have the resources for that, doesn't have an army 
to use of naval focus. Is it, is it resources yeah. in army, or is it something else at work here? Well, that there's, we've there's a question about soft power as well. Which, I, but, but, but I think what America does have is America has enormous, and it's still there today. America has enormous negative power, which sounds 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 bad, but it's it's the ability that nothing will take off in global affairs without America being there, and that is a form of dominance. You can see that with the environment. You know, nothing will happen on climate change unless America moves. Because unless America moves, China and India will never move. And so America does have that, has that ability to control things. Or to, the same is true of Middle East peace. The same is true of, of any number of things around the world. And so I think there's an element at the moment where America's feeling bruised, it's feeling battered. But I mean, to go back to your title, it's not, it's, it's not actually broken. It's still the dominant power for the foreseeable future. Because if you look at the alternatives, you're basically looking at China, which is going to be, well, I, I would bow to your knowledge on China, but it's going to take a, a long time for China to come up to the same level. And you're looking at the European Union, where there isn't, um, the, 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 there's no sign of the European Union going forward either. It's had all its problems through the Constitution and so on. And what worries me personally at the moment is not so much the balance between America and, and other powers, it's that the basic appearance of a sort of vacuum of leadership. You have Bush, obviously set back by the midterms and in trouble on a variety of fronts. You've had Chirac and Blair, as I pointed out earlier, withdrawing from the international scene. You've got the Chinese, um, Hu Jintao, in some ways trying to find an international role, but definitely not dictating it. You can see the, the, the mess they've made in Sudan just over the past few days. You've got Japan also slightly out of sorts. The, and the, the one interesting figure, I think, is actually Angela Merkel, is that you have this quiet, determined woman who's pushed her way to the top of, of, of Germany, who keeps on advancing very slowly in a particular direction. And she has additional power, partly ex officio, is that Germany is both head of the European Union and president of the G7 at the moment. So she has some degree of institutional clout behind her at the moment. But I think she also has a vision of making Germany a slightly bigger power on the international stage, which is, I think, probably a good thing, to be honest. You have the world's you know, third biggest economy sitting there, the powerhouse of Europe. And yet, when it comes to things like Afghanistan, when it comes to things um, even like Iraq, Germany cannot get involved because of history, which now seems a very, very long time ago. And Merkel wants to change that. So I think Merkel, Merkel will emerge, and the fact that she has good relations with Bush and Putin, I think, is, is interesting. She speaks Russian to Putin, and then, then I suppose, English and, to and Bush. And not German <laughs> to Bush. Yeah, that would be an interesting. <laughs> um, how, do you think, uh, how do you think history is going to uh, remember our president? I think at the moment it's going to remember him as, 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 as a, a failure on, on, a, on a big scale because he had this opportunity, particularly after, yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't want to depict September 11th as, the, as an opportunity, but right after it, there was a chance to, to push things in the right direction. But you look at what's happened in Iraq. You look also, I think, at the question of hearts and minds. I mean, very early on, um, I, well, after 9-11, uh, we began to campaign very actively against Guantanamo. I mean, yes, we, as you pointed out, we supported the Iraq war, but we also hammered them over Guantanamo. And I remember the, the incredibly hostile reception you would get in Washington coming across to tell people that you thought Guantanamo was a bad idea because the basic idea were these were evil people who needed to be locked away and quite honestly nothing was too good for them. But I think w w what went wrong at Guantanamo was that whenever America sort of sticks to what is American, it, it does amazingly well. And Guantanamo, the more and more you looked at it, was fundamentally un-American. It, it, it didn't stand for any of the things which America has, has stood for. And that, I think, caused problems. And, and, and the reason why hearts and minds, which again was originally seen as a sort of fluffy concept, nothing to the, the type of thing that, 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 that um, strange Europeans went on about, the reason why that matters so much in a battle like the one against Al-Qaeda is because without it, it's extremely difficult. There's no, there are very few examples of any kind of deals with or any changes to do with terrorist organizations which haven't involved winning hearts and minds as part of the process. And that, I think, has been a calamitous failure. And the, the mere idea that the Chinese, well, again, about to your knowledge, the idea that the Chinese can dare to bring up the subject of human rights with America as, as a, I mean, admittedly, as a negotiating ploy. But that, I think, shows 
how much ground was given away, and that's going to take a very, very long time to win back. You spent a good deal of time in this country and in Washington, and uh, I mean, this country is, in fact, uh, was, uh, should be something of a, of a beacon for the notion of a free press. Do you think that uh, our current government has a has an evolved notion of the necessity of a free press? You mentioned that you received a rather hostile notices about your... Uh... I, think there was an element, I think there was an element after 9-11 where uh, there was some constriction. I mean, not actually that much in terms of enforcement, and I'm, maybe people in this room would disagree with on that. It was actually sort of voluntary restraint, which is, to some extent is more dangerous. People, people gave everybody a pass, and you could argue, you, you, know, you mentioned the WMD in Iraq, maybe there's certainly a lot of evidence that a lot of newspapers, yes, probably including The Economist, didn't push things hard enough on that because there was an element whereby the government was something you could trust again, and also there's an element of being stuck in a, in a, in a battle against things. So I think there was, a, there was an element there there's an element certainly within the Bush administration that wants to completely ignore the main national papers. Um, they're a very clever, well-organized, and you have to say very successful strategy of going for local news, going for talk radio, going for some internet sites. And, and it worked unbelievably well um, from a political viewpoint. So I think if, the second one, in fact, I, I'm not really particularly, you know, that's, that's, that was their strategy and, and good luck to them. The, the, the first, I think, is probably abated. Now, now it's almost the other way around. People were back to the old sort of attack dog spirit of American journalism. Mm -hmm. So I think any, any element of the rights of journalists being severely curtailed, I think, has, has, has stopped. Do you think that uh, some of the decisions that have proven to be uh, rather disastrous will break the conservative sort of uh, fever will break the, uh, what, what you've described in, in one of your books as the sort of, you've, you've actually described them as having reorganized politics in America, mm. almost on Leninist terms. Uh, do you think it's going to have an effect in muting conservative, the conservative It movement? must, I mean, well, the, the most powerful argument against the idea that conservative, you know, America is a conservative country, that America is a, um, the dominant bit of America is conservative, uh, the, the most powerful argument against that is, is last year's midterms because some of the Democrats shoot up. But against that, I would argue, I suppose, three things. First, if you, if you look at the Democrats who won last time, um, who, who won in the midterms, they were a very different sort of species of Democrats to the ones you've seen before on issues like God, gays, guns. You know, they, 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 they took a much more conservative view. From my perspective, they also took a sort of hopelessly protectionist view, the sort of new lot of Democrats. But the Democratic Party has obviously moved towards this movement. And arguably what happens in politics is where you really win is when your opposition changes. I mean, you could see that. You could argue with Thatcherism producing Blairism. You know, Blair was a completely different form of Labour Party to anything that had existed before. And I think if you look at the type of things the Democratic Party is now going on about, it is actually a totally different version to the sort of old liberal, in the American sense of the word, um, Democratic Party before. So that, that would be one argument um, that, that they changed the opposition. I think the second argument, which is just basic, is that if the Republicans, if you were quite as incompetent, um, corrupt, pork-ridden, and, and basically useless as the, as the Republicans were prior to the last election, and you managed to win, um, that would have been a miracle. And I, I don't think any sort of theories about sort of... Uh, how voting is going in America, political allegiances can survive massive incompetence. And if you run a, a war badly, you have Katrina, you start building bridges to nowhere, you have all the pork things, you have all the scandals, then you're, you, you're in trouble full stop. And so from that perspective, I think that was just a simple competence thing. The last one, which I'm, I'm not sure about, but I think is probably true, is I think actually losing last year provided the Demo Republicans probably with slightly greater hope for next year in the presidential election, partly because if they had somehow managed to get through last year, I think they would have chosen an almost insanely right-wing presidential campaign and they would, have, they would have gone down in flames. But what, what has happened because of the loss last year is they've had to, in a sense, the conservative movement is incredibly good in America, and I, you know, I say this very much as an outside observer, it's incredibly good at reforming, at realigning. If you go back to 1992 with Bill Clinton, 
You know, two days later, they were burning the heritage um, uh, organization, heritage in, in Washington. The sort of effigy of George Bush Sr. was burnt very sort of merrily. But within two years, you had Newt Gingrich back again. And, and the, the, the ability of this particular movement to reform, to recategorize, I think is extremely strong. And so I would expect them to come back next year in some degree of strength. And, and then the, the only question is to what extent Iraq still bleeds away at that. Do you think the American electorate, and I suppose you could ask this about any country, is adequately informed to govern itself wisely? <laughs> I can see where you're going on this. Uh, well, um, I'm not I, sure where I, I'm going, but let's see. <laughs> yes, I think, you I think you have to do that. I think, I think the moment, um, it's the last refuge of every loser, basically, to say, well, they, you know, of course, the people are all, uh, and, it's, and it's elitist in the worst possible way to, to imply that these, you know, <clears throat> useless, terrible voters don't understand things. I think in the whole, voters tend to vote on a variety of things, but one is a sort of sense of, 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 of what people are, and rightly or wrongly, they looked at Bush and Gore, and they looked at Bush and Kerry, and both times they saw something closer to what they wanted in Bush. Which and you don't think that gets distorted by uh broadcast, television, all of the very sophisticated gets, marketing uh, devices? That... It, it, it gets distorted just as it has always been distorted. I mean, the, you know, the media is, is, a, is a sort of form of mirror which is held up against these people. And the image which comes through, I mean, go back to, uh, for instance, what we now know about Jack Kennedy. Um, was the media accurately depicting Jack Kennedy? I mean, you, you, you can meet various uh, sort of people who are boys on the bus who wax lyrical about it and then go on about how the modern media is giving Bush a soft time. And then you go back and ask them you know, how exactly they treated the president at the time. And, and, and I think there's always a danger, particularly in the media industry, of having a kind of golden age, roughly about 20 years before um, whatever period you're currently in. And, I, and that, that, I think, is, is something you should fight against, because the answer is it has never been perfect. And there are various organizations in the world which have never been Great. I mean, the United Nations, you, you, they, repeatedly people jump back towards the idea that there was once some wonderful period where everything went right, where, all right, Dag Hammarskjöld, whose name I'm now mispronounced. And the answer is, yeah, he, did, he, he was a very good Secretary General, but you look at the press at the time, the UN was consistently being beaten up for this or that or whatever. Same with the British National Health Service. Same with, the, there's a whole series of things which have never actually been that perfect. And we look back at it and always imagine they have been. Now, there is nothing, I think, that, that Americans like more uh, than for foreigners either to beat them up or to praise them. And so help us here, uh, perhaps restore belief in ourselves or uh, wisen us up a bit. Uh, should we be hopeful about our country? Yeah, I think you should be. Because mm -hmm. I, th I, I, th I think they're all, I think particularly sitting where we are today, if you look at you just you know, wander out into California and you see the breadth of industries here. You see the entrepreneurship. You see a whole, I mean, I would keep on going back to, I was here in the early 1990s, and at the time, California was laden with doom mongers. And to my naive European eyes, it seemed extraordinary because it's, here was this place which had every conceivable industry of the future you would ever want and had a variety, endlessly entrepreneurial series of people flocking in at the time, every single thing was gloom and doom. And what's, what was actually quite interesting about California at the time w w was the gap between um, business success and business possibilities, which struck me as endless, and then deeply dysfunctional government. Um, and the, the two divided. And in a strange sort of way, I think that's, that's actually emblematic of the way the world, some of the things I've, I've been talking about today um, fit into that. You know, Business people have seldom been more confident than they are at the moment. You know, wherever you look around the world, you, you, you see people thinking the world is their oyster. It's going to push forward the business people. On the hand, on the political side, you see real difficulties. I mean, we have a whole series of extremely difficult political disputes sitting there. And there's an odd kind of imbalance. Um, I, I, um, I went to Davos, a terrible word to use. But what, what was striking there was that it was the sort of wrong way around. They're meant to be the politicians, journalists, economists, they're, they're meant to be the people who have sort of dreamy visions of the future, and business people are meant to be the people who say, no, no, it, it wouldn't work like that, we couldn't possibly do that. 
And this time round, it was completely reversed. It's the politicians, journalists, economists, or whatever, all with deeply depressing views about what might happen in Russia, what might happen to Iran, what happens if Doha goes wrong, and a variety of things like that. And the business people saying, no, no, it's fine, we're still selling lots of shampoo in Russia, we're still pushing ahead at top but, speed. But, but wait a minute, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, that's uh, not necessarily, does not mean the, the escutcheon of the world is in good order, just because you're selling a lot of shampoo. No, but I think the business, I'm, I mean, I, I tend to fall on the category of people warning about problems. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting is that business people at the moment are generally optimistic. I mean, Russia is a very good example. Russia, Russia there are all sorts of reasons to be worried about um, Vladimir Putin who we recently depicted on our cover, dressed as a sort of Chicago gangster covering, carrying a machine gun. Um, uh, but you talk to the business people in Russia, on the whole, one or two problems, the oil industry to one side, they are making money. The Russian economy is growing. They are optimistic. And the reason why I bring that up is actually I think, particularly this area, I, I'm slightly on your side. I, I, I think that you go to Silicon Valley, you go around here, this, this is... We're living in an age where I think there's a danger of what I would describe as technological determinism, that because these open markets are pushing ahead, because technology and economic logic sit behind them, that they're bound to keep on increasing. And again and again, you look back through history, and, and nationalism, other irrational emotions come in and cloud this and mess it up. And the most obvious comparison is between the sort of description I just, somewhat cliche description I gave of, 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 of business people expecting the world to be rosy, expecting this age of globalization to go full speed ahead. You go back and you read stuff of a century ago and you read books which at the same time huge bestsellers talking about the idea that war was never going to happen again because it hadn't happened for years. And because that first age of globalization had so much behind it, you had the telephone, the telegraph, steamships, the beginning of planes, cars, it would, the world was coming together, small, coming to a smaller world at a pace unknown. And so that's one reason why, although you know, the economist has gained enormously from this current age of globalization, I, I don't feel that smug about it. I, feel, I actually feel rather worried because I think that, and again, actually, I think particularly this area, is one that the fact that you have a you can have a company almost run by an algorithm, I think makes people particularly susceptible to the idea that, that, that technology will just push everything in front of it, and I think there are real difficulties, uh, some of which we've discussed about. Now I want to get to um, questions from you all, and I think you've been uh, uh, you've have cards, and so please write them out, and there'll be people coming down the aisles. But while we collect the questions, l let me ask you finally. <clears throat> As you look out and, and, and survey what your magazine is going to be covering about this country, what are the three or four places where you, you really wonder whether we can get on top of the problem? Or are you pretty optimistic that ultimately... In terms of America? Or in terms, terms of America and America's role in the world. I th well, I think in domestically, health, the, the, the health care entitlements... I mean, again and again, this problem just... I mean, for as long as I've been writing about America, it's been a problem. And it doesn't show any signs of being um, solved. Weirdly, I think the Schwarzenegger plan is interesting like that. And also, to give him his credit, I think actually Bush's plan, which he'd been completely useless on until the, the sort of current bit, the fact he's now come up with some first step towards it. Um, ironically, having had all that political power before and not done anything about it, he's now come up with something which actually I think has shows some signs of, 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 of reality. But I think that's, that's a huge domestic problem. I think education, I'm now going to annoy every school teacher in the room, but that America has a gigantic problem to do with schools. Um, America has the best universities in the world. So I've now cleverly found a way to suck up to Berkeley. But, but, uh, <laughs> but, but there, there, is, there is an imbalance, a very simple one. If you look at European schools, or pretty much any schools anywhere in the world, they are turning out better educated people than American schools are. Every available test shows that. And yet, American universities are transparently better than, um, the, certainly than European universities and, and Asian universities as well. If you look at any ranking of universities, you can go to about 40 and barely get one or, you probably get three or four European ones and the, the rest of them are all American. And, and it strikes me, American schools are still a big area where things can change and it's not it's transparently not a matter of money 
um, American schools get quite a lot of money. It's, I think you have to go back to issues like, like, like what the unions do, the restraints on choice and stuff. And I think those, those, those are, those, that's a big issue for America of the future. And how about on the global front? America is, a, is a, able to project its power and, and lead in the world or in, intrude into the world? What do you foresee? I think America has to lead the world because if you go back to what I said before, the, <clears throat> the, the America is, it is the dominant power of our time for the foreseeable future. And so America has a choice. It can either shoot back inside its, its shell, which would be an entirely reasonable reaction, you could, might argue, to what's, what's happened over the past three or four years. I mean, you think of the blood and treasure that has been expanded in Iraq and the, the lamentable results as a result of it. But fundamentally, I think that's wrong. Unless America does stand for a certain set of values, and when it keeps to those, it can be amazingly successful. The, the key is to work, as you pointed out, perhaps more with other people. And there are real dragons to slay, and if you don't deal with them, if you look at, say, what's happening in Sudan now, look at what's happening in Somalia, you know, these are problems which will eventually arrive at America's door, whether it wants it or not. And so, you, in essence, you have to deal with these things earlier. And that is the trick about how to do that, um, where America faces its biggest challenge, I think. And they did in 9-11. They arrived at our exactly. doorstep. Well, are you optimistic that we will, uh, given our record of the past six, eight years, do you think we will rise to the challenge to, again, lead in a way which will we, in which we will find the world willing and, and eager to follow us? I think there's an opportunity, and there'll be a big opportunity, I think, after... I think there'll be a big opportunity after the next election for whoever becomes president, because there will be the sort of you're not George Bush phenomenon, which is, which is, which is, which is use, useful genuinely from a pragmatic point of view, because it gives people a chance to claim things have started again and, they're, and they're, they're, they're off on a different track. And I think that applies actually regardless if John McCain won, I think you'd have no problems with the French suddenly deciding that there was room to work with him again. There, there as I said earlier, deep transatlantic disagreements, but I think there's room to do that. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's worth noting, actually, even now, um, which I, I don't think is entirely impossible, if Bush were suddenly to come up with a new version of Kyoto, which I think is, is not totally unlikely, given some of the things he said recently, you would be, I think, surprised how much the rest of the world would gather around it, um, because America still does carry quite a lot of weight just even on issues where there has been such hostility towards it. And I think you would then have a different story to tell. You would, people would point towards the way that business in America is beginning to move towards greenery in a big way. They talk to, point to the way that Christians in America suddenly see looking after God's dominion as a big part of their responsibility. And other different bits of America beginning to center in on a slightly more greener agenda. But you, if you just imagine what would happen if Bush came up with a proposal of some sort in that direction. And I think you can see there, that there's quite a lot of latent goodwill out there, even if there is, um, as I said earlier, different values and a degree of suspicion. Well, uh, let, let's segue right into a question apropos of where you uh, uh, just ended up. What is your view uh, or the economist's view on global warming and the steps the US should be taking now? Um, our, general, our view on global warming is that the science, we are, we, 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 the bit, Historically, we've always been relatively convinced by the science. We were dubious about some of the economics because a lot of it, at least originally, of the sort of scaremongering sort was, 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 was mad. It used a whole series of weird measures. But on the, on the science, uh, you know, the evidence we now think is compelling that something is happening. In terms of what the effects will be, our basic as approach is that we should take effectively an insurance policy. We don't know what the effects of global warming will be. We don't know for sure whether the planet will change in some way which actually mitigates these effects and so on and so on and so on. But from a policy standpoint, the risk of something really unpleasant happening is now sufficiently large that it justifies, from our perspective, taking insurance against it now, which i.e. means spending money now. And if it's proven in the end, to be money down the drain because nothing happens. Well, that doesn't matter. It's the same as that there are various things to do with public policy that you do 
regardless of the proven thing because the, the alternative is so catastrophic. You take out insurance on your house, you, don't, you desperately hope that your, your house is not going to burn down, but you still do it. You have a standing army, even though you don't think you're going to go to war with anyone. It, it, it falls into that kind of category of risk. In terms of our prescription, we, we've always argued for a carbon tax, because a carbon tax is just the simplest way in which to, 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 to tax what is, what is bad about this. In terms of carbon trading, I suspect that's the way that the world is going to go. Um, and the experience from Europe is somewhat mixed, but it's still better than nothing. And it starts that there's always a danger of people having too much of a kind of freebie at the beginning on it. But we would support that. Mm -hmm. uh Someone asks uh, about the, uh, support for the surge, uh, whether or not it's narrow thinking, uh, and what about diplomacy? Does it serve the world well to refuse to talk with all five of Iraq's neighbors? No. All right, next question. Uh, <laughs> would you care to elaborate? <clears throat> well, no, I think that's, that, would, that, that was the bit of it, which is... I, I, I actually think, I mean, just to... to I've try, I try, tried you out on Bush, the Green President, the next one is um, an easy sell is, is prospects of peace in the Middle East. I think there is actually something, there's a beginnings, despite the, the, the horrors of what is happening in Gaza and the West Bank at the moment, and the horrors of what's happening up in Lebanon at the moment. I think actually there is, there is just the outside chance that something is beginning to happen, as the moderate Arabs, people like Abdullah of Jordan, um, Egypt, Saudi Arabia a little bit in this case, they, are, they have been so scared by Iran. Um, I was talking to uh, one of them the other day. That the, 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 their depiction of the execution of Saddam, which was widely put across in the European press, certainly as being the ultimate show of just how barbaric the Iraqis were, and also, I suppose, to some extent, to be honest, how barbaric sort of American-style crime and punishment could be. But within the Arab world, the case has been made to be that actually people reacted that, particularly in the Sunnis, reacted against Iran very heavily on that. They saw it as the Iranians taking their punishment on Saddam. A lot of the taunting was done by people from Muqtada al sadas brigades. And that there, this has had an effect on moderate Arab opinion. And the beginnings from this of actually most of the moderate Arabs, who've always in some ways been the ones who have failed to come together or fail to put any pressure of any consequence, that there is a chance, I think, of uh, the same token of Israel actually offering the Palestinians more than they've been offered before. And there's something emerging out of that, some kind of proposition you could put to the Palestinians in a form of referendum, a form of um, election, which Abbas could at least try to sell. And I think there is, if, if you can somehow patch up some sort of deal on that, which there is an element of a last chance emerging out of all this. Things have got so bad that both, I think, the Israelis and the Palestinians, there is a chance. I mean, it's a bizarre problem, Israel-Palestine, because if you, go, if you look at the numbers, in both countries there are overwhelming majorities who back roughly the idea of a two-state solution. You're, you're arguing really about very small amounts of difference about where the boundary should go. It's not, from that perspective, a hopelessly irreconcilable thing. I think there is a chance, at least, a tiny chance, that something will come out of that. You move on from that, you begin to do deals between Israel and Lebanon, and after that, you can begin to move on to Syria. And Syria, I think, is detachable from the other parts of the, of the difficult, um, nasty Middle East, to the extent that, in the end, it's a brutal but very pragmatic dictatorship. It, there's no point in doing a deal with Syria now because it's in far too much of a sort of triumphal mood. But if you began to do something to do with the Palestinians, you began to do something to do with Lebanon, then Syria, I think, would be detachable from the others. Let me quickly pose a, a scenario and then get you to react. What if Bush were to say, I give up? We've messed up. I'm sorry. We had the best intentions. It didn't work. I am turning this over to a bipartisan group of real deal makers. I, someone like Richard Holbrook comes to mind, who got the... Bosnians and that crowd together, which is a pretty uh, thoughtless task. And then let them go at it uh, in a bipartisan manner, internationalize the Iraq question to whatever degree they felt necessary. Would this not be a way out? What's your reaction? Uh, well, the first thing is that even if Bush said, I give up, in the end it's Bush's... Well, he it's could do Bush's, it more decorously. It's Bush's, um, it's Bush's power in the end which carries the weight. It's the president who has the troops. So I think there isn't... 
I mean, there, is a, there was a sort of handed over to James Baker element. I mean, if you, you look at Baker, Baker is a sort of consummate deal maker. Um, certainly, I remember during the 2000 election where, where, when the fight with Gore, when um, I think there's a rather wonderful moment on camera where Bush said that they were both sending their representatives off to go and discuss exactly who would get the, you know, how, how many hanging chads each side would have. And, and Bush, actually, slightly to his credit, introduced James Baker as a man of the utmost probity who would be a fair and entirely impartisan um, uh, decider. And he smirked slightly as Baker appeared. And from that moment on, it was always slightly obvious to me that Bush would come out of the Florida recount ahead. And I think Baker is, Baker is good at that type of stuff, and the Americans at the moment lack people who are like that. So I'm sympathetic to the idea of using people who are, who are, who are bruisers and who are, who, are, who are able to fashion those type of, type, of, type of conversations. But I think the idea that Bush can actually step back from it I think it doesn't actually work just because of the practicality of it. And, and because of him. Yeah. Yes. Uh, here's a question that cuts to the chase. Is America in decline, comma, yet? No. <clears throat> no. <laughs> well, it's right. not, it's, if you look at America, it's not in decline in terms of your economy is growing. Your, your economy is not growing as fast as some emerging economies. In fact, if you want a provocative assertion, you could argue that the most amazing thing that has happened during my nine months of editorship is not the sort of bombing, and you know, it's not the Lebanon war, it's not North Korea setting off, a, um, setting off a bomb, it's not things to do with Blair or Bush, it's a statistic. And the statistic is very simple. It's that last year was the first year that what we used to count of as the emerging economies actually produced more than the developed world. And okay, you have to cheat a little bit on that and you have to use purchasing power parity, which would take a very long time to explain, but, but it's as a measure of output. But that is a gigantic change, and it's a, it means that the emerging world is now growing faster than us. The emerging world is also, if you look at things like foreign exchange reserves, you look at things like the sources of pollution, it's a whole variety of things where this new set of balance has come in. And the point about it is it's not an emerging world, it's a re-emerging world. Because if you go back 200 years or 150 years ago, you see places like China and India were bigger back then than we were. So they're coming, they're, they're coming back into it. And that is, long term, there are challenges for America there, but it's not a zero-sum game. They don't have to win for you to lose or vice versa. Here's a questioner who wants to know, how have you changed uh, how you gather news uh, in Iraq? Have we changed it? I, I, the, the truth is we do the same as everyone else. You take what you can get. You, you, you have some people who are embedded. <clears throat> you have other people who, um, who, 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 who go in and out or live there and try and get what they can. It is very, very difficult. And um, nobody, I think anyone in my position would claim we had perfect, perfect news out of Iraq at the moment. Who will be the next president of the United States? <laughs> well, far. The, uh, well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give the answer which a pollster gave me on Saturday night, is that, that, that actually if you poll people at the moment and you gave them a split second, the American people a chance to vote tomorrow, it would probably be Obama on the basis that he is the person who seems to epitomize change and has the least, um, has the least historical difficulties in terms of having a story he can sell very quickly and the star appeal to go with it. I would still marginally bet on a, on a sort of McCain-Hillary battle in the end, partly because I think so much of the institutional clout of both parties is gathered around them. But Obama has certainly made the whole thing much more interesting. And the winner in a Hillary-McCain battle royal? <laughs> I'd narrowly bet on McCain. Interesting. Um, this is, uh, uh, apart from either withdrawal or staying in Iraq, uh, can you think of any other actions? Are there any other possibilities? Well, staying in is, 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 is be fair to Bush, he's not staying in, he's, incre he's increasing things. You can, uh, amongst the many mistakes earlier, you can argue that there should have been a hell of a lot more troops earlier. That was, that was just a basic failure to, I mean, it's, it was interesting talking to journalists who, you know, the, the, War zones, you, you, you go to these places, one of the ways, even, even if you're a kind of useless third world coup, the first thing you do if you're trying to stabilize the situation is you put a kind of soldiers on each street corner just until things can, um, um, calm down. At precisely the moment America should have been doing that, that was precisely the moment that Rumsfeld was playing his 
now clearly idiotic games about trying to prove that military transformation worked and was hawking, um, the putting, pulling troops out at top speed. That, 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 that was always very difficult. So I think for the answer of staying in or, or leaving, I'm, for the moment I'm, I'm pro staying in. We'll see what happens with the surge. Um, we, we, we've backed it, but um, we're we'll But, but John, you don't actually believe that 20,000 more troops is going to make a difference, do you? I think it could make a difference. If it, if, it, if it provides, the argument basically comes down to whether you have more leverage over Maliki if you say you're going to go. But does he have over lever any leverage over anything is really the question, isn't it? I think he has some leverage over the issues of the Sunni-Shia split. I mean, he, he is, he is a, it, it may well be that you force Maliki to go as part of it. But I don't think whatever leverage you have is going to go. I think the leverage would go if you said you were going to go, and it would escalate towards um, other forms of violence. But it is, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be, I'm, I'm not trying to claim that my view of it is, is, is completely correct, mm -hmm. is, 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 gonna, is gonna either going to work or indeed is absolutely correct. The truth is we don't know. Either way, it comes clouded with risks. I think the risks of pulling out are clear and they're ghastly. Um, the risks of staying in are pretty ghastly and pretty clear. But for that reason, we, 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 we've, we, we've opted for that. And three, four, five, six months from now, after the surge has done whatever it's going to do, um, then what? Then you see again. I mean, I'm, th there's and, and if we've gotten nowhere, what? If we've gotten nowhere, there is a point at which America should go. That's, it's, and that's when do you think that will come? Well, the most obvious one will be when the Iraqis ask the Americans to go. But they sort of have, haven't they? Not clearly. <laughs> But would we ever know if they ask clearly? When the government, the government, and the government comes and asks you to go, then you go. I mean, yeah. there's the, the but boy, you know, that, that is late in the day when the, when the, you know, the handmaidens, the harem government of the United States asks it to leave, ask the master to leave. I mean, that is the most unlikely control group to ask us to leave of anybody in all of Iraq. Isn't I disagree. It? I disagree. I think I think if you're if you're a democratic Shia government. You have a, you, you, you are to some extent. I mean, you have you have to a small extent to trust democracy in this. Mm -hmm. I think I think if they I think if they if they thought there was a popular vote in getting rid of the Americans, or getting them to go right now, then they would do it, mm -hmm. and they haven't. Well, here's a question uh, close to my heart: uh, Do you have a plan to publish a Chinese version of The Economist? The answer is no, um, but we have, I mean, China is a, it's a, I mean, there's, there's a lady here who can, who can tell you at great length what it's like to be a, um, an, an editor of a magazine in China. Um, from, a, from our point of view, it's a very difficult, it's a difficult market in two terms. One, the first is language, very obviously, <coughs> which you've drawn attention to. But the second also is censorship, um, and, that, and that is a real problem. Um, about how, for instance, if you tried to print it there. Some other news organizations have started to do Chinese language websites, which actually I, th I think there has been some success at. Um, you have to be very honest if you do them that you are censoring yourself because what they tend to do is they go in with a great flurry about how independent they are. And it is true, they do all publish articles about, they, they, they publish the same articles that they do in their old, old translations of their English language ones, um, but they tend strangely to ignore subjects like Chinese politics, which, um, which, which people in China might find interesting. And that, that, that to me actually, I think if you go in openly saying you are doing that, I think that's, that, that is a reasonable thing. It's slightly get back to the Google argument, when Google got caught in all these, these panics about um, China. And their answer, which was not perfect, but I think was probably correct, was that it's better to be there than not. And I think to the extent that if people are providing information mainly to do with business and the economy or whatever, that is probably better than nothing, even if they're not um, doing things on party corruption or what's happening in the Shanghai mayor or whatever. It's, so if, I mean, I'm, I'm quite interested by the idea of a Chinese website for that reason, or a Chinese internet version. And the advantage of the internet very obviously is you get around the distribution problems because trying to do it inside the country is incredibly difficult. Um, they used to, I think I'm right in saying that in order to subscribe to the economists there, you need a form of kind of government permit and you, you see the difficulties all from that. And maybe quickly, just following up, here's a question that wonders about China's role in Africa and Hu Jintao's trip to <coughs> Africa. How do you say that? 
Is he going to clean up where the West has sort of uh, left the... I have mixed feelings mm. about the China and Africa. China and Africa. I, in general, I've been very sceptical of it because it's, it's obvious to me that they are doing deals with African governments of a sort which is not necessarily helping the West in the sense that the standards we've tried to hold African governments to, they, they really don't care too much about, particularly in terms of human rights. The, the one place where the Chinese have been appallingly destructive, just full stop, is the Sudan. I mean, the, any ability to leverage the Sudan, to put pressure on the Sudan, has been held up, I think, criminally by the Chinese. That said, I think there is increasing evidence, and we, we see it from our reporters there, that actually the Chinese are doing a good job in terms of just basic things like building roads, railways, the, 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 the odd, odd things which people, you know, a lot of other people have talked about doing this stuff. The Chinese are actually getting there, and they are becoming a sort of form of micro-level colonist, but actually in quite a sort of positive way. They are, they are building infrastructure. They're not just talking about doing great big projects. They're actually doing water things and so on like that. And so it, it, I, I'm extremely nervous about it, but I think it's too easy to just condemn them as being these sort of mineral-grabbing people who are coming in and building presidential palaces and, and, and football stadiums. I think there's a degree of exaggeration in that. But, I, but, but, but th th there are some good things the Chinese are doing in Africa, but it's that relentless source, the relentless search for mineral rights and for energy is driving it, um, rather than any particular altruism on their side. All right, last question. Uh, who would you like to see win, the Democrats or the Republicans in the next election? And then this questioner asks, how does one get a job writing for The Economist? <laughs> by, by knowing how to avoid the first question. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're not going to let you uh, uh, well, the, avoid we, it. We endure, <clears throat> I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'd be crazy to say who we would endorse next time. Um, but but aren't the, you a magazine in the midterms, of opinion? In the, no, in the midterm election, we told people to vote the Republicans out because we just thought they'd made such a mess of it. Um, we don't always, um, in the previous election, we voted for Kerry, and the one before that, we voted for Bush. But doing the midterm election thing was slightly unusual. We don't always do it because midterm elections are difficult. But we thought the performance of the Republican Congress, by anybody's standards, um, had been so lamentable that um, they justified being booted out. So I'll, I'll talk about what we've done in the past. Is that a, is that a and decent how you, way to escape? How do you get a job at The Economist? Send, send a letter or send, send an email and a CV. Well, listen, uh, before we say... Uh, <laughs> Not you, Orville. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasurable that that would well, be. Well, thank you. Uh, before we say thank you, I want to uh, say thank you to some of the people who really allow you all to be here. Um, uh, Kaylee Cusick, who put this whole thing together, Leah Thompson, Marsha Parker on our staff at the Journalism School. Uh, a lot of work goes, goes into getting all of this arranged. And um, So uh, let's thank John for being here and The Economist for helping us on those three. <laughs>